when you first got into music production, what was kind of the context? Like what kind of music were you listening to at the time? Yeah, so my route into production, it came via DJing. That's, yeah, that's what I was doing first. And really the, the big musical movement that captured me growing up was dubstep. Mm -hmm. So we're probably talking around 2000 and 2006. Mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was getting into that. And, you know, around that time, and you know, a couple of years later, started going out, to, going out to the events um, that were were happening in London and around in my hometown of of Reading. And yeah, I just wanted to get involved with the uh, with the scene. So originally, I was I was DJing. And yeah, they were really important formative musical times for me. It was really exciting to be part of the. Yeah, the early days of, of that genre, relatively speaking, um, when, yeah, the really the lines of that genre were being just being drawn. So that was that was my way into DJing. And then I think just as a natural progression and just out of being a, a curious person, I yeah, I'd, I just had to learn how to, to make the music myself. And I think that the in inspiration was I wanted to at that time make music which which had a had a, a compelling impact on the on the dance floor um, and to be able to provide that that experience for people. So yeah, it was it was really dubstep that that got me into it, um, and then from the dubstep. I, yeah, I then kind of went into a more house and techno direction. However, it was, yeah, it wasn't like I jumped from dubstep to, to techno and house. I kind of, in some ways, I merged those two, two genres. So in, in the UK, dubstep was really, was really popping for a few years. Um, dubstep and grime, but we're talking about the first wave of grime, like grime's got quite big again um, in the UK. This was the first wave of it. And overnight, it seemed, I'd, I'd moved to Bristol by this point, and overnight, it really felt like the, the twilight, twilight years of, of dubstep had, had ended, and everyone started getting into house and techno at the time. But to me, that that didn't really didn't really fit with the the style of music that that was my my go to. Um, obviously, there's so much less impact in a lot of certain house and techno records. Um, impact that you know I'd grown used to through the dubstep and and the grime scenes. So. Yeah, my my next my next creative phase once I'd really learned the basics as a dubstep producer was really fusing this this dubstep and grime with the template of of house and and techno in a way that that felt coherent with my my musical taste. Um, but yeah, Justin, that's that's what we'd spoken about the the hardcore continuum and yeah, this this interesting family tree of of musical genre. And so, uh, I was I was chatting with Hugo a few days ago, and we we're talking about music, and he mentioned this you know kind of like scene and the style of music that I'd never heard of before. Um, and yeah, Hugo, maybe you could tell us a little bit about deep tech. And was that the point of intersection that you're describing between, you know, dubstep, I, like ultimately dubstep, but like this, you know, UK club music and um, house? Yeah, exactly. So that was, that was the intersection, what, what became known as deep tech, which was a, a, house, a house scene in the, in the UK, which... I would say it was around 2013 to 2016 when that was in its in its heyday. 
And yeah, as you said, that that scene was almost the first intersection that you had between what's known as the hardcore continuum and then house music, which was its own its own branch of um, of, of musical genre. So the hardcore continuum um, that was defined by a, a journalist and musical sociologist called Simon Reynolds. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's worth looking into his his work. Um, but yeah, the hardcore continuum is what's described as that that kind of family of of music that that started with. Uh, the the kind of fusion of of acid house and uh, junk and and yeah acid house rave music and dub reggae sound system culture and it was when sound system culture really became fused with uh, electronic music in the, in the UK and uh, the kind of the genesis of it was was jungle music really that was the first the first iteration of of what became known as the hardcore continuum and yeah by the way i'm 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 kind of spitballing on this i'm not i'm not an expert on this but yeah this is just my what i know about this or at least what i am yeah i'm aware of um and then that that same musical thread continued and continues to today through a lot of music in the UK. So you had Jungle, and then you've had Garage, you've had Grime, you've had Dubstep, you've had got Funky, UK Funky, and all of these, all of these styles of music derive from sound system culture meeting electronic music. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of some of the signatures of, of the styles of music within that continuum, they have things like MCs. Um, they'll pull back tunes, like you might rewind a tune if it's if it if people love it. Um, you do you know what I'm talking about, Justin? Yeah, when I say that, yeah? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, that's cool. That's cool because yeah, in a, in a lot of genre, it just doesn't happen. Um, but yeah, things like a rewind, um, you got MCs, you've got a lot of a bass impact you've got drops um and a lot of and a lot of sub bass um so yeah that was the kind of um the the fabric of the the music that i i grew up listening to and when everyone else started making getting into house and techno i didn't feel like there was a coherence there so what what i and and others did was began to bring those those sound system culture influences and those hardcore continuum culture um styles connected them with with house and techno techno music and at, at the same time uh, a kind of a dance a, a specific dance developed alongside that scene particularly in in london which was called uh, foot shuffling or cutting shapes and yeah it's 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 yes, yeah, an impressive, impressive dance. I'm, I was never involved in the dance side, just just making the music. Um, but but yeah, that's my that's my journey into uh, house and techno and, and how I ended up where I am today. And yo, if you're cool with it, maybe um, could I, well, if I hop on Spotify real quick and play a tune off of your XL EP to like give people a, a sense of what we're talking about with this style of music? Yeah, go for it. Awesome. Um, is there a track in particular that uh, you'd like to share off this record? Yeah, let's go with Control.
control. Such a dope track. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, we, we're talking about the hardcore continuum, the idea of like, you know, how all these different styles of club music evolved like into each other and inspired each other within the UK. Um, you know, could you talk a little bit about how that, how, how that manifested in this track, you know? Like where's yeah. like the UK funky or the grime influence? Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so the hi-hats like we could look just look at elements like the hi-hats it's got those hi-hat rolls you know and just yeah. it's got a basic a very basic beat just basic hi-hats um it's got those claps da, 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 da. that's that's almost a signature clap pattern of of grime music um and the the bass the way the bass comes in it's like it's it's high it's high impact you know like it's the kind of it's the kind of track that's designed to to make people go nuts you know it's not designed to make them turn in inside and have a kind of introspective um, experience um so yeah i think yeah i think those are the points and i would stress by the way like this this whole hardcore continuum continuum thing. When I was working on that track, for example, and working on that music, I'd never heard of this continuum, or I hadn't considered the way that music is a family tree and these things. We were just we were just messing about, um, and you know, making the music that we wanted to hear. It's only retrospectively that, um, yeah, I've, I've been aware of the 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 kind of context that 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 music was was in. Um, but is it fair? And that's really cool to hear that it wasn't like, a, like it wasn't like a, an academic endeavor <laughs> to like, you know, say, how can I bring all these things together? But you were just, you know, you were living that music. And like one other detail I'm curious about when I heard it, you know, how there's that high synth that plays like, duh, 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 duh. is that like, do you think that was kind of like a grime thing? Oh, too? most definitely. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Duh, 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 duh. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, grime, grime there's there's going to be some similar similarities with um like other forms of beats you know like trap beats as well they've got those rolling hi-hats they've got similar kind of claps and like maybe similar kind of melodies so yeah it was yeah it's definitely a fusion of fusion of 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 different different worlds and that's that's actually something which i've you know always considered and something which i you know continue to consider a lot uh, by the way, I made that track, um, well, several years ago. So that's probably came out in, in 2016. So we're looking at around five years ago. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm in a different creative creative space now. Um, yeah, yeah. And maybe we could, could you dig in on sort of the journey from, you know, from that EP to Metamorphosis, uh, your album? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. So it's almost it's almost hidden in the in the name metamorphosis. Like that album was for me about my kind of development and my journey and my growth as as a as a person and uh, as a as a as an artist as well. So you know, at the time when I was working on the on that control EP, you know, I was, I was in the clubs a lot. I was living that, living that lifestyle. I was, I was going out, I was partying much more. Um, but as, as my priorities have changed as a, as a living human over the past five years, my, my creativity has also reflected that. So yeah, metamorphosis is about, yeah, it's really about my growth and, and representing all of the, the music that I've listened to through my life in, in a kind of package that, that um, also is, is reflective of, of where I am today. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very personal. It's really intertwined with me as a person. Um, 
there was one point I was going to make before as well, which was when I was talking about combining genre and how that's kind of what happened with deep tech. I definitely suggest that to, uh, to people as well, is that one way to be creative and to create something new is to combine existing existing things. I think that all all innovation really is just fusion of of existing ideas in 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 new ways. So, yeah, it's it's not a bad idea when you're making music to, you know, consciously consider. Okay, what can I what 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 influences from from these disparate worlds can I bring together that creates something something new? Dude, wild. Um. You know, before we dig super deep in metamorphosis, I and and do our you know some, some track demonstration stuff. Um, one other question that I wanted to touch upon. Um, so, you uh, you work at Novation as well, and you know I think just one thing that a lot of artists kind of grapple with is sort of you know how to juggle you know different parts of your life, whether it's like a job and making music and, and that whole side of things. What's been, what's been your experience with that stuff? Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I'm also, as you said, I work in the music, music tech industry and that's, that's really where I've, I've always been since I, since I finished uni. So just a bit of a backstory on that. I, I went to, to uni or college in, in Bristol. But, you know, why, why I really went for that course is because because it was in Bristol and that's an incredible musical city you're, you're aware of as well. Um, and they did a music tech course there. I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life at that point. Um, so there was a good city with a course that had a name that sounded um, interesting. So, yeah, I just just went for it without really knowing what what would be on that course. And it turned out that that course wasn't about learning to make music. Um, that, that course was more about uh, software development and, uh, and engineering, audio engineering, uh, DSP, digital signal processing development, um, and this kind of, yeah, this kind of domain. Um, but in fact, it turned out really well because I, yeah, I learned to learn to code when I was there in specifically the, the domain of, of plugins and synthesizers. And what really compelled me to, to, to study was that I wanted to become really good at synthesis. And uh, my, my calculation was that the best way to become good at, at using a synthesizer is to build one myself and you know understand how to make it because if you can put something together like it's, it's going to be a walk in the park to um yeah to use it um so yeah that kind of led me into the the music tech industry so when i finished uni i ended up going to going to berlin and uh yeah working there is as an audio software developer so yeah, I did that. And then I kind of transitioned into to product management, which is um, more like, yeah, the strategy side of, of music tech. Um, but yeah, so I started with software. So my first product was Circle 2. It's a soft synth. Um, and I just launched, before I joined Novation, a synth called Sublab, which is uh, is a really good for um yeah like 808 bass kicks that that kind of thing and yeah now now as as you said justin i'm uh, yeah with with novation and yeah working on hardware synths and and midi controllers so jason i think that's kind of like the first part of the question which is like how how did you how did you get there and then I think the second part was 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 um, it was around uh, the balance and how you balance kind of working alongside alongside music. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I just see AJ says he's you sub lab. Nice one. Nice one, AJ. Glad to yes. hear that. Glad to, glad to hear that, man. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're talking about balancing work and, and music. Yeah. So 
it's yeah it's an interesting one and it's it's been a kind of a, a tug of war for me and and i've i've really learned through trial and error the best way to to approach that so i think my assumption at first um let's say when i'd finished uni and i was you know i was at that point where i had to get a job or make music or or whatever um at first my assumption was that the more time I spent making music, the more music I'd make and the, the better quality it would, it would be. Um, but yeah, over the years, I've, I've actually discovered that that's, that's not the case. Um, so yeah, I said before that the, the time spent making music um, is, is non-linear relative to the amount of music that, that I actually make. So, yeah, I've written the best music of my life while I've had a, a full time job. And, you know, I'm I'm coming home after that and I need to let off steam and I've got a short amount of time just to just to get everything out there and just to kind of um, express this kind of chaotic, chaotic side of myself that's been like packaged up while I'm at, while I'm at work in the, in the daytime. That's when I've written the best music of my life. Like I've had periods where I've been 100% making music all the time. And yeah, to be honest with you, it, it's to me that didn't lend itself to um, creative fulfillment. Um, yeah, there's, there's something about just focusing on music all, all day and that being the only thing you'll do where I, I kind of get tunnel, tunnel vision with that. Um, yeah, and on the yeah on the on the other side of it as well, when you're relying on music for for an income, it it really changes your your relationship with with music making, um, because creativity is then kind of squeezed into uh, yeah this kind of professional domain which has completely different expectations. Um, and yeah, creatively for me, that was that was more of a negative than a than, than a positive. So now I'm I'm really really comfortable seeing um, music as as a way that I, I let off steam in my in my spare time. And counter counterintuitively, I write my best music when. I have that relationship with music production. Dude, that is so dope. Um, yeah, it's funny. I, uh, I relate to that. Um, when I was in college, the, uh, I would, my school, I would have, you know, waves where it was really easy and then like finals week or like midterm exams. And the less time I had, I felt like sometimes the more productive I was, <laughs> but I loved that. Um, yeah, and then just couldn't agree more with that. There's like no correlation between the time you put in versus like the quality <laughs> that you get out you know like it's it's just random it's just yeah. total randomness right it's it's really counterintuitive it really is <laughs> yeah it really is um and it took me took me many years to to understand uh, that that contradiction yeah Dude, wild i also really love how you described that process of coming home to make music, uh, you know, you need to like blow off some steam. I feel like so much of mu music fundamentally, it's about like channeling the things you're feeling or, you know, emotions. And, you know, that's, you know, it's like when you need it as that outlet and, and then have even maybe just, maybe you don't even have all the time in the world to, to, to overanalyze and over tweak every aspect, but you have to get it out <laughs> for like the, uh, like, you know, emotional catharsis it's like maybe the yeah. the shorter time keeps you from tweaking that one hi-hat <laughs> forever and just moving on to the to the real emotional <laughs> expression is that fair to say yes yeah yeah in fact i i even find it like uh for myself like mentally unhealthy to be making music too much because of that state of mind that i'm in when i'm doing it if if i'm doing that for too much of my life like i just uh yeah, I spend too long in that that kind of chaotic headspace. I have a very chaotic way of working where I'm I'm really just throwing shit at the at the the door and just seeing and what what sounds good until something does. 
and yes yeah, it's, it's it's very chaotic and and kind of living in that that headspace for for too long yeah i found isn't isn't a way for me to even op operate optimally as as an individual so here's a, yeah mm. here's a funny question for you because yeah, i mean also you're like an insanely like your your productions they're so like technically impressive and just like this polish and the insane sound design too like just in terms of maybe earlier on i'm curious of if, like do you think there might have been a chapter early on in your like journey where you were grinding and pounding hours to develop the skills and then maybe at a certain point there was like diminishing returns or like you know like was there like then to now any differences in the amount of time you're putting in and what was actually worthwhile yeah so yeah, so it's a fair question. Yeah, because it's like, do you need to put in all that time regardless just to kind of build your to build your chops? And I did, however, um, to get to, I guess to get to where I am today, there was it has been useful technically to have spent, you know, some of those extended periods. Um, however, um, there was a lot, a lot, a huge amount. Most of that time was was wasted time. You know, because it, it's it, it was time where I wasn't actually learning the technical side of music production. It was the time, you know, it was a lot of that time was used just just, you know, just tweaking things that I already knew how to do. So mm -hmm. if I if, if I had just approached it in a kind of strategic way and said, OK, I'm, I'm, I'm here to to learn techniques. I'm not here to make music. Uh, yeah, probably. You know, I could have done with just ten percent of the time that I took, um, because you know, a lot of the time when we're we're making music and learning to produce, we're kind of learning as we create. So we're making music, and you might learn something here and there. Um, but yeah, I do think that if if I was to have just condensed it down into like a you know a shorter, a shorter like intense specific uh, learning learning period, then I would have. I got to the got to the same place, and and the other thing is that so much of it is a trial and error. Um, yeah, I think that if if I just had had somebody uh, to or had you know future me to just tell me you know five ten ten years ago so a few things I could have just you know sliced off a a huge amount of of time that that I I spent going in in circles as I suppose a lot of a lot of people do. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm at the point now where I, I work in a very simple way. Like my, my approach is, is, yeah, is, is very simple. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was saying the other day, Justin, that some of the, some of the most, most important, important music of, of all time is, is incredibly simple. And, um, yeah, so I'm I'm thinking right now to some of the really pioneering early grime and dubstep, um, and a lot of pioneers in in all genres who were there at, at the kind of the genesis. You know, they're just people who are in their bedroom with like probably a copy of FL or something like that, and um, you know they haven't got a big studio. They don't really know very much technically, but it's it's just testament to the fact that you can change the world of music without without knowing all of this this technical stuff like that's that's just just on the surface the the key is is the the creativity and what what comes from from the heart dude one last thing that i want to touch upon before diving in on some ableton stuff um you know i feel like this is all aligned with like you know <laughs> the, the the battle against perfectionism <laughs> is that something yeah. you can speak to yeah yeah definitely so yeah i think what what i said is uh, my my maxim and this is yeah something which i which i try to try to stick to is that perfection is the the enemy of progress and the reason why i i kind of ended up with with that approach is because of the the amount of the circles that I ended up in making making music when I was trying to make something perfect and I think it's a trap that we we all fall into as music producers is um 
yeah, thinking that whatever the project we're working on, it, it needs to be perfect. And what I realized is that is actually a, it's a trap. Um, if you if you're trying if you're striving for for perfection, you're you're only going to damage your your progress because you're going to feel you're going to feel shit because the music is never going to be perfect. So you're never going to finish it. You're going to feel shit about that. And then you're just in a, in a feedback loop. Um, because then you feel, because you don't feel good. You don't feel creative. And it's this, this feedback loop that you get into. So uh, yeah, the place I've got to now is that no, nothing, nothing should be perfect. I think something only has to be good enough. And that's, that's what we should be, should be striving for. Um, I know a lot of people who, yeah, who've been, been kind of peers as music producers and uh, what's, what's held them back is, is perfectionism and not knowing when to, uh, not knowing when to, to stop. Um, I think that's, yeah, it's something really, really important for me. Dude, I relate to that 1000%. You know, the, I feel like even just the, the distinction between what you describe as like perfection versus striving for good enough. It's huge because I feel like when uh, I feel like we're also at the most risk of like ruining our songs when we are over fixating on this idea of perfection, which is like not even a real thing. You know, where you're tweaking this stuff. <laughs> you're about to say something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, was, I just thought that perfection, perfection is like infinity, right? Infinity is just a concept. Like we'll never know what infinity is. It's the same with perfection. Like it's it it, it just keeps going in the same way that, that infinity does. Um, so it will always it will always elude us. It will always elude us, man. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, nothing should be perfect. Nothing should. And the other thing is, when you get into those circles, you just end up hating your music and not having fun because it's it's never up to the the quality that you're you're expecting, and. Um, yeah at the end of the day we we should be having we should be having fun with this that's when you make that's when you make good music like a lot of music production isn't fun there's a lot of disappointment involved in it you know and there's difficult times when you you know you're not having ideas and you're kind of not feeling creative but at the end of the day it's it we should be having fun and and that's when the that's when the, the magic happens let's go dude by the way nikki dude i'm stuck nikki nair is in the mix and <laughs> nikki says perfection doesn't slap and I, <laughs> I concur, <laughs> dude. Um, but you know, it's it's also funny because, like, you know, I think we can often hear amazing music and, you know, hear like amazing production and be like, wow, that is perfect. And just really, you know, Hugo, a lot of your music, I feel like, <laughs> makes me feel that way. I'm like, a damn, it's just so, just so dope, so polished. And to hear that this is something you've grappled with and that you think about quite conscientiously of like, you know having fun, just striving for good enough and removing that like extra bit of pressure that would drive, that drives most of us like to madness and like disillusionment. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Madness and disillusionment is real. Like it's, it's a dangerous, <laughs> it's a dangerous game. Dude, you but have that only, or fun? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's only, um, yeah, and it's only when we're listening to other people's music that, that we're kind of, we view it in an an, uh, an ob objective way. So when you listen to my music, you know, you, you, you hear like, you hear it as someone who's not, you know, not been listening to it or, or, or pieced, pieced the puzzle together. Um, but a, as an example, um, I don't know whether you've ever been in a, in a studio with a friend who's mixing, mixing down a track. And, you know, they might have two examples of their, their pre-master where the kick is you know either two two db higher or two db lower and they're like really racking their brains like what do i do here and you know you might walk in there and just say like i can't hear a difference like it, when you're working on a track like you hear it in a different way but no one else hears it like that no one else hears hears those subtleties so yeah, that should give us the confidence just to, uh, yeah, know when, know when something is, is good enough and, and when we're reaching the, um, the, yeah, the point where we need to, uh, need to let that one go. Dude, love it. Um, I think on that note, let's, uh, 
let's look at some music. So I think you have the project for uh, Matter of Time open. Yes, I do. So let me see if this works. Okay, let's just try the audio. Works for me. Yeah, okay, we're looking good. So here we go. So this is a matter of time, which is a yeah, track on the album that I just released. Um, I'll yeah, I'll play a bit of it just so I, yeah, you can hear what the, the vibes are. Uh, but yeah, first of all, I just wanted to just open up these tracks so you can see how simple this is. This is a what is it? We can see here 16, 16 channels, including including the drums. This is not this is not complex. Um, and yeah, I think the most powerful powerful tracks are the ones that ones that aren't. Um, so yeah, I'll just play uh, yeah some some bars of this. So yeah, that's that's the track we're we're looking at today. Such a um, dope song, by the way. Just I, I love some of the comments. The uh, dude, just so much emotion. The planet <laughs> surfing, like, dude, amazing. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, thanks, guys. So yeah, let's let's think about where to start. So yeah, the the driving force for this track is this this chord sequence here. Let's let's solo that. And yeah, there's there is some variation to those notes um, later on, but fundamentally, that is the track. So yeah, I just wanted to start by talking about um, yeah where these where this chord progression came from because some of you might have seen that we've got these these notes down the side here. So yeah, this and by the way, I'm not trained a trained pianist. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of self-taught when it comes to the the theory side of things. Um, so here's a technique that that I learned right. Right here, these are all the notes from the, I think this is, yeah, e, e minor scale. And you can line all those tracks up along the side. And then you can basically see all of the notes that are available in that scale. And here, what I've done as well is just lined up all of the chords from this scale. So I, I started the track like this by just lining up all the chords in the E minor scale. So then what I've done is just selected the, the chords that I want to use in this progression. And uh, yeah, then I'd just voice them in a way that sounds, sounds nice. Um, yeah, and I've done that by, yeah, you see a lot of notes here, like uh, 
connecting like these connected notes here these make it seem like the uh, the progression is kind of merging into into itself um but yeah that's that's a good technique and there's there's a really good youtube channel i actually recommend called hack music theory and um yeah it's, it's got a lot of techniques like this for um yeah for hacking music theory really um so yeah recommend do recommend that um but yeah in in, in other music i'm i'm using this technique or i'm uh yeah, I'm just figuring notes out myself or yeah, using some like chord, chord plugins in, in Ableton. Um, okay, so yeah, that's the, the pattern. So we can get rid of that. So now let's have a look at the synth patch here. So pretty much all of the synths here come from Serum. Serum's my, my go-to synthesizer. And uh, yeah, I just I just like it. I like the UI. It's the one I've the one I've used most. I like how the wavetables work. Um, so yeah, let's let's go and have a look at this patch. I just seen some questions in there. So one says, I notice your your project has a lot of MIDI. Do I bounce tracks? No, I don't. I don't bounce tracks unless there's unless there's a specific reason to do it. Uh, for example, if 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 uh, a synth patch is is phasing, um, and and that phasing changes each time I I play play the loop, then uh, yeah, I bounce it in that case. Um, but yeah, generally I I don't do the bounce. Do or I don't I don't feel the need to bounce. Um, oh, cool. Someone's. Uh, Oh, nice, nice. Someone's saying if you if you click on the scale option on the left, it'll drop down. That sounds good. Uh, yeah, there is a there's a scale. Yeah, this was made before Ableton Eleven. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely check that out. Thanks for the tips. So let's look at the patch. So yeah, here's Serum, and look how basic this is. This is just a uh, just a sawtooth wave. Um, so yeah, I'm going to turn off all the, all the effects. And as you can see, these are all just stock Ableton effects. Like if I need to do, if I need to do some, some quite surgical EQing, I might use a, a pro Q. Uh, but yeah, generally I find, uh, yeah, the stock effects work for the, for the most part. And it's nice to be able to see the, the waveform in the, in the EQ. So yeah, I've turned off those effects and yeah, just turn this one off on the group, which also affects it. So this is the raw patch coming from Serum. So yeah, super simple. It's just a uh, sawtooth. Uh, with some unison and some detune. Uh, but yeah, what gives it that character is, yeah, a bit of LFO modulation on the master tuning. So it's, it's, it's the, the tuning is modulating slightly throughout the whole track. So it goes slightly in and out of tune. Um, yeah, highly recommend giving character to uh, patches by slightly, slightly modulating the, the tuning. Um, and then the, the other, uh, mod modulation here that's giving it character is this this envelope to the course pitch so that's what's that's what's making the the pitch dip as the, the note hits so i'll just just demo that so yeah that's that's all it is inside serum um so then i've got the uh i've got the sausage on there which is uh is a good one is a good one um so yeah i start the kind of processing chain outside of serum with uh with the sausage and uh yeah then another really key element to this sound is that that kind of pulsing pulsing feel that you get
So I just brought that back in by turning on the compressor, side chain compressor uh, on the channel and then on the group. There's no reason why it's on the channel and the group other than, you know, just disorganization and chaos. Um, before, before I got this, this project ready to, uh, to share with, with all of you, um, it was a complete mess. Nothing's titled, nothing's colored. Like it's all, um, yeah, it's very messy. Um, there's tracks which aren't doing anything. Um, and yeah, as you can see, there are elements of processing here, which are, I don't know, pretty much, uh, yeah, pretty much useless, but they just, just happen to be there. Um, so next up, there's some uh, filtering. A uh, bit of reverb, just from the, the stock reverb. And uh, yeah, I did actually have a, a reverb send with the Valhalla verb, which is, which is really good. Um, but yeah, you know, for some reason, I just used the uh, normal Ableton reverb there. Um, a bit of echo. And then I've got, I've got more filters here. So what these filters are doing are, yeah, I'm using these for, for automation. So I'm, yeah, I'm creating, creating movement throughout the track basically with, with this guy and this guy here. So I've got a kind of, uh, this is a low pass, low pass filter that I'm automating the cutoff and then a high pass that I'm automating the cutoff. So I've, I've got independent filters there that I can kind of, bring the lows down or bring the, the highs up at, at various points in the track. Uh, I then got a delay here, which is, again, this is one that I've used for automation specifically. So yeah, you can see that I've, I've automated that up just before the, the breakdown. And then finally, I've just stuck, uh, stuck an EQ on there to uh, get rid of any low end so that it doesn't disturb the frequencies of the, the baseline. And then, we get the finished article. You can see an example of how I've used uh, the automation of this, this auto filter. So you can see this is quite a resonant high pass, high pass filter. Oh, that's a low pass, resonant low pass, low pass filter. Here. And yeah, you can see that when the, the pad comes in for the first time there, uh, I'm kind of opening up that filter and yeah, it, it, it gave it this kind of subtle, this kind of subtle drop. It's not one where it kind of blows your head off. It's one that feels like it's emerging from, from uh, underwater or something like that. So that sounds like this in, in context. <laughs> So yeah, then the other key element is the, the bass. Again, this is um, super simple. This is just a sine wave with a sawtooth and there's no unison, unison on this one. Um, so the unison tends to give sounds a bit of, a bit of width and movement. Um, usually for a bass, it's, it's good just to keep it in the middle. I mean, for sub frequencies, keep them in the middle always. Um, but yeah, I've even, I've even put the the kind of low low mids of this this baseline in the middle as well, just to uh, make it feel like the the bass is in the middle, and then the the width is is coming coming from the unison on the the pad which I showed before. So the bass sounds like this. And yeah, I've got an EQ on there, but that's that's just rolling off the tops to make room for the, the, the pad. I would have just stuck that on when I was mixing down. It's, it's not doing much to be fair, uh, but it's there in case any yeah any free, any frequencies were to uh, get in the way of the of the pad. Um, I oh when I say that. Uh, generally, it's good not to have, you know, a clashing frequencies. Um, kind of the, the higher the higher you go up in the frequency spectrum, the less important it is for frequencies not to not to clash. So when we're going down to, to subs, there should be no no clashing frequencies whatsoever. There should be a yes a single 
subharmonic. Um, yeah, and then when you get up to, to hi hats and, and everything else, as you know, it's it's you know it's it sounds still sounds good when they're when they're layered up. Um, so yeah, that's just some some EQing that I did on the on the bass. So I've got a couple of other channels which use this this same pad patch, which kind of leads the leads the track. Um, and so I've started just with a, let's have a look at this. So I've called this one intro pad. And okay, so this patch is slightly different. The other one was just a sawtooth. I've, I've got a different, I've layered this up with, uh, with another wave in the, in the intro. Wrong one, this one. So yeah, because I've layered in that the different wave, this one here that's called hyper, that yeah just gives gives the the intro pad a slightly different characteristic to the the main pad, and yeah, having that slightly different characteristic does does make it more interesting when the other one kind of grows grows out of it. Um, yeah, and you can see here that I've yeah I've also got a couple of auto filters and I'm I'm automating in the, the same way, automating highs and lows at different points in order to create this kind of blend and to create um, yeah more of a a journey and a, a, a dynamic uh, dynamic listening experience. So one other layer I've got within this same chord sequence is this one that I've called dist pad. So this is a, a distorted pad. So I'll just play this one on its on its own. So this patch is so this is actually the same as the the intro pad so it's got this additional additional wave led in this hyper wave and um yeah as you can you can hear it sounds completely different to the intro pad um yeah the reason for that is this processing that you can see here so if i turn off this eq you'll you'll hear what the saturator is is doing to it And then if I turn off the saturator, there you can hear it's just a normal sound again. Um, so yeah, if we listen to all of uh, this processing, so it's basically a very distorted version of of this pad with some very harsh EQing done. So we're only really getting these frequencies. Well, that's from about one kilohertz to, to seven kilohertz. So we've got very tight frequency information in, in this, this sound. And if you look at the automation, okay, you can see that I've got utility on this track and I'm using this to um, automate gain. So generally, if I'm automating gain, I'll always use uh, utility um, because if you start automating your, your actual mixer, mixer track, levels then it just becomes a nightmare when you want to mix the track down so if you look at the automation on on this uh yeah this channel here you can see that i'm kind of bringing it in let's say halfway between this the first section and then halfway between the second kind of drop section and what this is doing is just giving more interest and adding some yeah adding some evolution to that that uh that pad chord sequence and i think yeah using this really saturated and then hard eq'd version of it it really gives it some grit and really gives it some some character so when you hear that coming in you it, yeah let's let's just play these this these three patches together mm -hmm. 
So you can hear that, that that kind of grit just grows into uh, into the patch. And yeah, the, a lot of this track, it feels like it really, it's almost elastic the way these different elements grow into each other. And then you've got this, um, yeah, this, this kind of uh, pitch envelope when the sound comes in, it feels really kind of stretchy and elastic. It's not about, it's not really about impact. It's about this kind of evolving, evolving journey. But yeah, effectively, this is a parallel, it's almost like I've done some parallel distortion here, but I've, I've automated it. So parallel distortion, you might know, that's just where you layer up a, a very distorted version of, of a, uh, a sound with itself. And effectively I've done that, but used it with automation to create a, a, a dynamic change. It's really cool how you have, you know, I, I really appreciate how there's, there's um you've layered all of these you know the, these three you know tracks of the chord um sense and i feel like the way you've used them it feels like one musical idea that just keeps on evolving throughout the song which i think is it, it, it strikes a really cool balance of like that simplicity while maintaining that interest throughout um one question for you because you mentioned between the you know, the first half and the second half, there's a bit of variation. And I'm curious if that's represented by the colors. And if so, what is, what's the difference between the MIDI? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So the, yeah, the colors here, the, the different colored clips, this is, yeah, this is saying that, okay, these turquoise ones are different to the, to the red ones over here. So yeah, let's just have a look at these, these clips. There, that's it. This. Hmm. This is the difference. This is the difference in the, the second drop. You get this extra chord here. Um, so yeah, it just adds additional movement to the to the progression. So it adds, yeah, just a bit more bounce to it. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a really good point about simplicity. And I think that's that's one of the hardest things is creating something that is is subtle but still engaging. Um, I think, yeah, one of the one of the tendencies when we're when we're making music is to um, yeah, kind of throw throw many different ideas in um, and, and and have things changing a lot. Uh, but yeah, sometimes sometimes you do just want to be able to um, yeah, really make the most of 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 one one idea. So yeah, that's yeah, it's definitely what's what's going on here, Justin. And it's cool, dude, because like, you know, I think you can you can feel it in the track that it picks up in that second half. There's this like added, you know, sort of movement and, you know, intensity. Um, but I, yeah, like never realized it was just one additional chord like in that spot, you know, and all of a sudden you can you can feel it. Um, and I, I just yeah. think that's <laughs> that's it's it's. I think it's kind of the same way with a lot of what you've just shown us with these different layers, how I think you've done such a great job of this track on like finding those, those details that like you can feel and maybe, you know, versus the details that like, you know, the perfectionist might tweak where it's like, no one's going to ever feel this <laughs> minute like difference in like one dB versus two dB type of thing. It's, it's, uh, it's like very like, razor sharp what you've done the distortion layer the the difference between the intro layer and, and the main layers it's, it's really yeah cool. and there's there is there is some more justin so yeah there is also this this tap layer that comes in the second half hmm. so this is just in in an omnisphere patch so that comes in in the in the second half so yeah there's some interesting panning in that but that's really subtle these are the kind of things that come in you can't really pick them out, but you're just aware that there's something has changed, but they're, they're the subtle subtleties. And then the other one is this thing that I've called the guitar. So yeah, again, this is, this is what I showed earlier where I've used a lot of saturation and then 
push that into a low pass filter. So it's highly saturated, but with not, not too many uh, kind of grating high frequencies. And uh, yeah, I'll just play that, play that one. But that has so much more character than if I just played the patch on its own, which sounds like this. You know, it sounds quite cool, but it just sounds like a, you know, pretty bog standard, um, yeah, saw, saw patch. But yeah, when you stick these on, there's, there's so much more character. And uh, so, yeah, that along with the, the kind of uh, the all similarly distorted layer of the, the pads, yeah, it kind of creates this, this crunchy texture that kind of builds in, in the track. Um, yeah, oh, so it, those, it, are, those are the same One also quick thing, because I, 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 I love how like that additional layer also, it still, it feels so like gelled with the other chord layers. Do you think you could play the group with all yeah, that stuff sure. happening. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's how it how it all interacts. Um, yeah, I can move on to talking about some of the other other elements. Have we have we got time to keep going a bit longer? Just yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, one thing I don't know if I mentioned is I've got this kind of this track here that I've called Ghost. Uh, this is basically just a muted muted kick drum that I'm using to trigger the side chain of the sidechain compression on that pad. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely a useful, useful technique. Um, the drums is super simple. So the drums are just, um, yeah, a uh, pattern I've, I've put together using, using drum rack. And yeah, processing wise, it's, yeah, just a bit of compression and a bit of saturation on the, the output of all of those drums. So that kind of, uh, yeah, just just pulls it together, gives it a tiny bit of bit of texture. So I'll play it with it with them off, and then I'll I'll turn them on. So yeah, just kind of glues them together, and then gives a, a bit of crunch. So that's that's very subtle. And then in terms of um, processing individual drums um yeah I'd, i'll just i'll have just uh cut the the low frequencies out of everything except the the kick drum and yeah i've got to send in here so i yeah you can see that i'm sending these to uh yeah this reverb as well the valhalla reverb in the in the drum rack to uh varying degrees but yeah super super simple on that oh as well there's um I've just got a groove on here, so just got a swing from the swing templates in um, in Ableton and applied that to to this loop. That gives it that that kind of garagey garagey style groove. And yeah, again, these colors just signify variation. So you can see where it changes. You can see I'm adding an element in this this green section, and uh, yeah, then. Well, taking out the kick in the in the breakdown there. Um, so I have, yeah. I have one quick question for you, dude. Because um, so you know the with your goat with that ghost sidechain trigger kick, um, 
does it play the same pattern as the actual kick um, in the track or is it a different pattern? It's, it's playing a different pattern. Ooh, like, yeah. Could you break that down and, and sort of what that, uh, how that process came together? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think that's a good point because that's probably what gives it quite a unique groove because normally you're just side chaining the kick with, with other things. Um, so yeah, let's, let's just have a look at that in isolation. So we've got the bass in the pad here. So if I turn on that ghost, uh, yeah, you'd be able to, to hear the effect that's having. And what I'll do, I'll, I'll solo the, the real kick drum. So yeah, you should have heard there that the yeah the ghost kick is following a different pattern to the the normal kick. Um, in terms of how that happened, I haven't got a clue. I don't, I don't know what I don't know what happened, Justin. It just is. Yes. That's that's how it is. I don't I don't know what happened. Probably just messing around and uh, it's it sounded good. Yeah, there wasn't really much uh, um, intellectualization behind it. Um, but yeah, I think it, it just sounds really good having having that different different side chain on the yeah this this pad. It's got that like what 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 what. I, it just sounds yeah, it just sounds sounds really good. So dope, dude! It reminds me of like old Joy Orbison. Was that an inspiration at all? Um, not Maybe consciously, not, <laughs> not consciously, but cool. yeah, Joy Orbison's a legend. Dude, yeah. Um, just curious, do you think? Because the, uh, I mean, obviously, like the biggest distinction I hear is like your actual kick pattern is is more simple than the side chain pattern. Is it? Do you think you drew both MIDI from scratch, or do you think maybe you began with one and then copied and muted things? Like, do you think the the actual MIDI data is related, or do you think you drew both from scratch? Mm. I, I'm gonna be honest. I've got no idea. No worries. Dude. I've got I, no idea. Like dude, my, sometimes I, my, it's a blur. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I expect great. what I expect what happened is that originally I did side chain it to the same pattern as the kick, um, and then I yeah I I realized that if I if I moved a couple of notes here and there it it just gave it something something special. Uh, really if I moved cool. a couple of the the MIDI notes. Um, but yeah, as with, as with most creativity, like it's a lot of it just happens accidentally, you know, great ideas just happen, happen by accident. Yeah. Um, um, so, so yeah, that's that. And I think yeah. the other thing as well, it's, it's probably possible, but it's probably really weird to try and take a side chain input from a drum rack. So yeah, ending up with that ghost, get that ghost channel. It does allow you to, um, yeah, to uh, be more experimental with with what you're you're side chaining. Totally, dude. Totally. Um, and then, sorry, sorry for taking us on that tangent. Then there's the uh, the effects section of this project. Yeah, yeah. No, feel free to uh, yeah go on to uh, any <laughs> any tangent any tangent you like. So yeah, let's go look at the effects. So yeah, I've got a t some tape pierce here. I've got some some waves and then some vinyl crackle. So the tape piss and the vinyl crackle, we can just listen to them. Standard bit of tape piss, probably cut the lows, yeah. And then we've got some crackle. Yeah, that's does what it says on the tin. Um, it's yeah, pretty much just a couple of layers which which give some some imperfection to it. I think when things sound sound too perfect it's yeah it's something something doesn't sound quite right um so yeah i'm also i'm, I'm trying to add some some imperfection to it by using those um and then so these these wave samples 
if I play this without, yeah, without any of the processing, So yeah, that's literally just some recordings of, of some some waves. I think someone just took a, a microphone to the down to the beach yeah, over in over in Hawaii, and uh, yeah, recorded recorded that, and then put it up onto uh, Freesound. So I, I think Freesound is really good. Um, yeah, not sure if um, yeah if if you haven't heard of it, it's worth checking out. Yeah, basically people are just um, yeah uploading random stuff that they record and is a really good source for unusual sounds to use in your music. So through the processing on this, this waves track, which I'll put back on and play again. And I'll, uh, yeah, I'll show you this, uh, this automation so you can see what's happening. So I'm automating, I'm opening up this, uh, this low pass filter here as you move towards the, the kind of drop sections where you do want a little bit of, 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 of impact um, to help the, the transition. Um, so yeah, this is what it sounds like. And then in the intro, it's it's just very, very filtered. Yeah, so what that's doing is when it's very filtered, it's just giving ambience. And then when you open it up, it's basically turning into a, into a riser. So I did the same thing. I've saturated it hard and then pushed it into a low pass filter. And yeah, then, then I'm able to just use that as a, as a riser. Um, but yeah, I think it's much nicer to use these kind of organic, this kind of organic material for creating like effects, risers, impacts, that kind of thing, um, rather than just, you know, taking, uh, taking samples from, from packs. So I think there's something I love to do is use organic sounds. So like sounds of waves, um, sounds of, of raindrops, um, sounds of different uh, animals, like a sound of a tiger roaring or something like that but just processing it in a way where the listener's ear, they can't, they can't tell, they don't know what it is. They, they're not gonna listen to that and think, oh, I can hear some Hawaiian waves. They're just gonna, just gonna hear this kind of, this, this bed of, of ambience adding some, something to the track. And um, yeah, I quite like to do that. I, I, I feel like there's something in, in, the, in the, the human mind that makes us, on some level aware of aware of certain sounds we're kind of pattern seeking creatures so when we hear something that that's kind of familiar to us it, it has some some kind of effect even if subconsciously so i think using sounds of of nature is ways to uh as a way to um elicit emotion in the yeah in in the listener and add emotion to the track Dude, I, I love this moment where you kind of, where the wave at measure 57 stops and then you have that like filter opening moment as a drop. Um, it's like, you you, you know, when, when the, all the highs suck in, it's like, it's just so satisfying. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's all about creating that, that interaction between the, the frequency ranges and the different elements and, and just turning it into... Yeah, something that, that grows and stretches and, and evolves. Um, but yeah, that's that's something which is generally generally useful is if you've got a lot of texture, if you've got a lot of atmosphere, if you remove that in the sections where you want there to be more impact, um, that's yeah, that's a good thing. It, it kind of adds to the impact when atmosphere is is removed. So if I just play this section, um, yeah, you'll you'll catch my drift. Um, and yeah, and as you said, you can see we've got this this filter opening up here on the on the yeah the pad. Oh, and if I if I'm to look at this intro pad, we've got the filter actually closing. 
So we've got a filter simultaneously closing, and then we've got another one opening. And then we've got this filter also opening up on the riser, but then the riser falls away and is, is no longer there. And yeah, you can see there's also, uh, this will be a high pass and a low pass filter. So almost uh, on the intro pad, the, the frequency spectrum is being kind of closed. It's being closed to the middle because I've got a filter closing in on, on both ends of the spectrum. So yeah, let's just, just listen to this. And then, yeah, I've just got a simple, simple riser here, which uh, again, highlights that, that transition. Because one thing is I'm not, I'm not adding uh, a new bass line. I'm not adding a bass sound when this track drops. So there's not really, um, yeah, a bass line to come in to tell the listener, okay, like we're in the, we're in the track now. So I've had to create that using these uh, other elements of, of the track. So yeah, that's how it how it flows. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of questions in here. So someone said Chase. He said uh, he met, he noticed uh, the clicky sound on the side chain. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look on a lot of videos, a lot of forums, people will probably say, "Oh, you don't want that kind of thing." But it it really doesn't doesn't matter if there's a, a small click on that. I mean, just yeah, just use your ears, man. If it if it if it sounds good, then just leave it in. Uh, again, Jack Burt, uh, he's saying, do I start with synths, then drums, or drums first? It, it really varies. I don't have a, a kind of, yeah, I don't have a set technique. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll load up a synthesizer and, um, yeah, just experiment and, and try and create an a interesting synth. Um, and then I might, you know, start adding the drums. Um, yeah, other times I will start with the drums. So yeah, it 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 really varies. It it could be either, but I would recommend um, starting tracks in different ways. Don't only always start with the drums or always start with the with the synth. Um, yeah, sometimes start with the drums. Sometimes start with the synth. Sometimes start with the vocal. Sometimes start with the the vinyl crackle. Just yeah, just just mix it up, mix it up, and yeah, you'll have better ideas. So yeah, I think the, the last part to this here was that vocal. Okay, so yeah, this, this vocal here, this is just a simple, simple sample that I've taken from Splice. So if I, if I turn off the processing, you can hear it. Oh. Let's try that again. So that's what the, the sample sounds like. I've got saturation, I've got an echo, I've got quite radical EQing. Again, quite some quite harsh saturation, filtering. Again, more EQing, taking off the tops. You can see I'm doing the same thing again. It's a pattern in this track, I'm, I'm saturating and then filtering out the, the high frequencies. So yeah, that's, that's it's giving this whole track this kind of crunchy, crunchy feeling that I'm, I'm using the same kind of processing in, in different places. So with all of the effects, that sounds more like this. Oh, and I'll just turn on the automation so you can see. So yeah, with all of the effects, that just sounds like this. And yeah, you can see that this automation is, is kind of, is moving up and down. So I'm opening, I'm opening the filter here, closing it, opening it in. I probably just, just put this in randomly and just tweaked it until it, until it all sounded good. Um, but yeah, at this point, the filter will be more open. So you'll hear some of those harsher saturated frequencies. And then you can see the filter there. You can see that it's closing. It's opening up again. 
So then when we listen to that in context. So yeah, that's that's the vocal. And another another point that, that I wanted to make is the vocals that I recorded on my on my album, they were all recorded on on mobile phone, just on like a WhatsApp voice message. Like I I, I do believe that um yeah, if you're recording vocals for dance music, then you don't need you don't need good microphones, you don't need like a recording studio. Um recording it as a voice note voice note or whatsapp voice note is is completely fine um and to me it gives it a really nice texture when you record vocals on a on a mobile um so yeah that's definitely definitely worth trying and there's something that's as well right. that yeah there's something as well that i really like about um you know receiving a voice note on a whatsapp um or just recording receiving a, a voice note that someone's my friend has recorded on their phone because you know then when that goes into a track it feels like it's you know it's like it's that that element has really been taken from the the fabric of my life it's not something i've gone to like the recording studio and like um got everything perfectly set up for it's just like that that sample has weaved its way through uh the, yeah the, the fabric of the the way that i i kind of live my my day-to-day -day experience so um yeah and there's a really nice really nice compression on on whatsapp uh it makes vocals sound sound really good um so yeah yeah seriously i i, I can't recommend it enough because i used to think oh if i need a vocal i need to go to a studio but if you're if you're trying to make something that's like um yeah that's kind of a bit more experimental it's electronic music we're not making um like a billboard billboard number one number one track here we're making underground electronic music that needs to have a character and and interesting texture so yeah that's that's definitely something that's that's worth trying sweet so i've got one question there from jack um do i automate on the channel or via a bus um so in in Ableton, we got these groups, and then yeah, we have these. I don't know if it's called actually a bus in in Ableton Jack, because we have these sends to these auxiliary tracks, and then we have the groups. But I when I used to use logic, I was more familiar with what bus meant in, in that context. Jack, do you mind um yeah, just describing in a bit more detail the question? And Hugo, are you good to take a, a couple questions from the crowd generally? Yeah, definitely. Let's let's go into that. So yeah, I don't know if so yeah, I don't anyway. know if if Jack, yeah, I don't know if Jack heard us, but yeah, don't don't worry about that. I'll I'll just do my best to answer it then. <laughs> so it depends. Sometimes I sometimes I'll automate a send, sometimes I'll automate uh effects on a sometimes I'll automate a group, effect on a group, other times I'll automate effects on a on a channel. I don't have any rules. I'm just, I'm just, it's, as I said, it's, it's quite chaotic. So yeah, questions. Um, Feel free to comment Chase. your questions, guys. Just drop them in the chat. Cool, let's go for it. Chase, so Chase has said, how many songs would you estimate you made before you were bringing the heat on the regular? Well, um, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for saying that I'm bringing the heat on a regular. I appreciate that. Um, I'd say it took me, probably took me about, I would say 18 months until I was making, making music that wasn't um, horrendous. 
Um, so yeah, not how many, not sure how many songs that would have been. I think it's hard to, um, yeah, it's hard to quantify it in terms of in terms of songs because I I spend a lot more on some some songs than another, but it was probably around around eighteen months before I I was yeah making music which um, was was ready for for the clubs and ready for for radio. Okay, we've got Kevin. Hey, Kevin, thanks for your question. Kevin saying, how do you change energy from section to section to help transition for the listener? You talked about removing frequencies. Yeah, so in, in this track where it's, it's, it's quite subtle, um, how the track progresses, a lot of it, a lot of that changing of energy is either done with adding or removing elements. So you can see that I'm adding, uh, yeah, I'm adding that main pad at the, the drop section here. And that main pad is, is um, it has more high frequencies in it. Um, so yeah, I would say that if you want to, if you want to add energy, um, add more high frequencies to your, to your kind of uh, synth elements and remove atmosphere. Um, but if you want to kind of build up to, to, to drops and transitions, then yeah, you want to be doing things like, uh, things like, uh, you know, a riser, a riser is basically just, a, an, a, a progressively more and more high frequencies being in, introduced. Uh, but what kind of gives impact with that is that on the, the drop there, they're kind of removed. So you'll, you'll see here on these, these waves, that I'm opening up that filter. And then that goes away when the, the kind of real drop of the, the track happens. So yeah, Kevin, it's, it's a combination of adding, removing elements and adding and removing frequencies using, using filters. Yeah. So Zach, he's saying, do you automate while mixing or as you make the song? Um, so Zach, thanks for your question. I, I really, I don't really have a discrete mixing and song making steps. It's, it's more of a blur. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of mixing, I'm doing a, a, a rudimentary mix as I make the song. So yeah, I'm probably putting like an EQ and doing some rough EQing as I go, just so things don't sound horrible. And so I can hear them in a, a roughly accurate context. Um, so yeah, when it comes to the, the automation, again, it's, it's, it's similar. Um, and yeah, I, unfortunately, it's not a clean answer. The answer is it, it depends. Like in, in some cases, I'm, yeah, I'm automating as soon as I've got something in there because I know that that's very crucial. Um, but I think, I think that it's, it's relative to how important that is, how important that automation is. If there's some automation that is, is very important to the track, then I'm likely to do that um, in the, the earlier stages of the, the production. Um, and then I'm, I'm mostly doing the subtle, subtle things when I'm, when I'm mixing. Um, but again, it's, it's, all, it's all quite chaotic and, and things, uh, yeah, things change at, at different times. Um, so yeah, I would just say, I would just say experiment as, as much as you can. So Coinsy is saying, do your ideas work every time? How long does it usually to take for you to scrap an idea and start afresh? I think that's a really, really good question, Coinsy. So my ideas definitely don't work every time. Like 90, 95% of the time, they're complete crap. Um, like it, for me, for me, it's, yeah, it's about turning up in the studio and then, um, yeah, just throwing out ideas, throwing out idea after idea until one of them, it just catches, catches the ear and is like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's special. 
um, and then you know spending time on that and then invariably once you've listened to that a uh, hundred times you realize that actually it's it's um yeah it's it's not that special after all and then you end up going back to the back to the beginning so yeah i have to say that my uh my my process it, it is very cyclical it's it's almost like a, a kind of a conveyor belt kind of uh a conveyor belt of ideas um and only a very few of them reach the 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 end point which is releasing them um and yeah often you know things just get moved back moved back moved back to the beginning um and i think that conveyor belt is when when you're kind of filtering for for the the quality um but yeah it's it's um yeah it takes takes quite a lot of time till you till you really have something that reaches the yeah the quality that you that you need hope that answers your your question coinsy uh the second half of it was how long does it usually take for you to scrap an idea and start afresh um again that yeah it really really depends i mean there's there's are there ideas that i've probably spent like 50 hours on and then realized and and then gone off it and realized that I, I didn't want to continue with it um there are other times where you know i'll just spend two minutes on a on a short idea and then go back to the beginning so yeah it, it really depends sometimes a very long time sometimes not very long uh dancing hey dan so any tips on processing recording vocals from voice notes? Um, yeah, I think just just a bit of EQ is EQ is fine, um, EQ and reverb. But you want to get get creative, like get creative with your with your EQing, like uh, because at the end of the day, if you're using a vocal from a, a voice note, you're not using it because it's going to sound perfect. You're going to use it because it has character and because it's it's come from from your your life so yeah i think the first thing to do is realize that you're not trying to make it sound perfect you're trying to make it sound interesting so i would i would just suggest uh yeah cutting off low frequencies although whatsapp mobile phone probably do that for you already uh, but yeah maybe tame the high end i think the the high end can be quite can be quite sharp when it's recorded on on voice notes. Um, yeah, stick some reverb on, and yeah, just 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 go wild and yeah, do do some some crazy stuff. Um, try like try saturating it like saturate it into a filter, um, like I was doing in this track, and then it'll kind of really really crunch it. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I would suggest. Start another plug in Nectar. Nectar is is quite good um for processing vocals you can just flick through presets and it uh yeah generates interesting results very quickly um and that loops in with what i was saying earlier about um having a short amount of short window to to make music in you have to find these ways to uh to be to be quick you have to find these shortcuts um so yeah something like nectar so you can just flick through the um, flick through those uh, those processing um, vocal processing presets. Um, cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Hope that helps. Alan K. Um, okay. Thinking about the mantra of non perfectionism. When you're at the point of finalizing the mix, do you listen in different environments? And if so, how much of that kind of testing? gets you to the point of I feel I've listened and adjusted enough yeah good question so yeah I generally do listen listen on on different systems when I'm working on a, a pre-master so I've got a pair of Adam A7Xs here I've got these headphones the Bear Dynamic DT770 um, I will listen on both of those because sometimes something will sound great on the, the monitors and then sound trash in the, the headphones. Um, so actually I try and do that quite early on um, because there's, there are times when I've worked on a full track on my, um, on my speakers 
listen to it on my headphones and realize that the whole thing has to just go in the bin, which is, is not a good, good situation to be in. Um, so yeah, I tend to listen quite early on the headphones and uh, monitors. Um, and then when I'm, when I'm working on a pre-master, um, I'll try and spend, I'll try and spend at least um, a few days on the pre-master, not working on it for all that time. In fact, the pre-master doesn't, so it doesn't take me very long because I've normally done some EQing while I'm working on the track um, and, you know, some other processing. So pre-mastering for me is normally just some EQ and some, some reverb. Um, so yeah, when I'm working on a pre-master though, it won't take long, but I will make sure I sleep on it for a few nights. I'll come back to it the next day, sleep a couple more nights, come back to it again. Just make sure that it sounds, um, yeah, it doesn't sound, um, doesn't sound wrong. Sometimes you go to bed and you wake up and then you think, what, what have I done? It sounds, sounds appalling. Um, but yeah, so I will test in my, in my car, that was a good place, um, and in my iPod headphones. Okay. Um, oh, and if so, how much? How do you? How much of that kind of testing gets you to the point of? I feel I've listened and adjusted enough. I think that's a really good question, Alan, because that's kind of saying how do you know when it's when it's finished? How do you know when when that point is? And. Um, so it's partly partly intuition where you just kind of know, but if you rely too much on intuition, you can just fall into that, that perfection trap that, that sucks us in. So the other part is just time. It's where you think, okay, I've spent, I've spent long enough on this. I need to, I need to um, yeah, move on to something new. So yeah, it's definitely time. Um, I think if, uh, yeah, if, if I've, if I've got a pre-master to deliver, then I will generally, I will generally give myself, say, a week to, I'll say, okay, I'm going to finish this pre-master in a week. And, you know, at the end of that week, it's like, okay, that's, that's it. That's going. And by the way, when I say pre-master, I just mean um, my mix down. I, I, I mix down my tracks when they go go for go for mastering so when i deliver the pre-masters when i do the final mix um okay thanks alan jack burt uh i hear a ton of emotion in your productions from the hardcore deep tech bangers to the breaks and experimental vibes any directional tips to achieve that emotion please that's yeah that's that's a really big question jack um, because there are different ways, there are, there are many different ways to achieve emotion. Like in the example that we've looked at today, a lot of that emotion is coming from harmony, is coming from that, from that chord sequence. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the, the clubbier stuff, um, so the, the deep tech bangers and other, other bangers, things like um, uh, Ghost Note uh, that came out on 17 Steps and that kind of thing. Um, there's not really much harmony in those tunes at all. It's just straight up bass weight and just impact, bass impact. So it depends what you want. If you want something subtle, then yeah, you really need, uh, you really need harmony. Um, but then if you want like um, full tilt club banger, then you need, um, yeah, you need simplicity and you need, you need bass, yeah. I hope that answers a question, Jack. Awesome. Uh, we got Dan here. He's giving the voice notes a roll. Good shout. <laughs> Dan Singh. Hopefully, yeah, I hope it works out well for you. And cool. Kevin's off. Jack's. There's Jack. Sweet. Cool. I think uh, I think we got some rhythm. Dude, good stuff, guys. Thank you so much for all your questions. I uh, <laughs> Hugo. I had one friend who couldn't make it. Who he's dude twist and turn off your dance tracks ep uh was just like one of his favorite club records ever <laughs> do you remember what the the lead synth uh from it what you used was it a plug-in was it analog gear do you yeah that's it, that's yeah that one's serum or serum dude yeah yeah no no serum 
Serum's good. That's um, yeah, that's my go-to. And yeah, it's that's a super simple that track. It's just a pentatonic scale, so just a five-note scale. I think I was literally just just playing the black notes until some yeah something something good happened. Um, but yeah, for for people here, I I don't use much um, outboard outboard gear. Like I have some bits and bobs. Um, use the Peak Base Station Two um, on on the album, but yeah. For the most part, I'm I'm in the box. Um, it's the fastest way to work, and yeah, I'm 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 here to work quickly. Sweet. One last question. Uh, that lead synth in Outer Space Jam. Um, do you remember like what was that serum as well? Different plugin. Outer Space Jam. Oh, <laughs> I know. I'm like yeah, no, 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 no. That, that's a good. It's a good question. Um, I think it was. I think it's. I think that's silent. But you can do that in anything. You can do that's just like a self-resonating filter. So you just you just uh, crank up the the resonance really high, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that just modulate the the filter cutoff. And uh, yeah, the, the self-resonance of the filter creates the the tonality. Um, so yeah, but you get a different character in the the filter on all different synths. Um, but yeah, I think that one was, um, I think that one was silent. Yeah. That, that the self resonating thing, um, when you say modulate it, do you have it? Because it doesn't sound like it's on, it's like it re triggers every time, like every note or something. Do you know, like, how you do that modulation? Um, yeah, I'm trying to recall. Oh, yeah. So you can assign, um, try assigning the velocity to the, the filter cutoff with like Ooh. a very sharp resonance. And then each time you hit that note, you're going to get like, a, you're going to get a different sound. Uh, or you can also just assign um you can assign the key like in some sense um like serum let's just pull up serum here one sec yeah in serum for example you've got this note here mm -hmm. so you can just assign that note to the cutoff crank that up there you go you've got it right there um yeah or yeah the other one velocity there you go bang that's pretty yeah. much that's pretty much the sound right there. And then you just got to, got to layer it up in uh, in the right way. And um, yeah, you're good to go. That's sick, dude, that's awesome. <laughs> Love that. Um, all right, I think, uh, dude, Hugo, thank you for taking all this time to share your insights, perspectives, open up that project and walk us through it and, and then answer questions, man. Like for me, it, this was just, such an insightful, amazing experience. And I'm sure everyone here feels the exact same way. Um, could everyone please unmute your mic and one more time, give it up for, for Hugo. Let's go. Hugo. <laughs> yes. yeah, Unreal. Um, dude, yeah, much love. Congrats on Metamorphosis. It's an amazing album. Everyone, please go check it out. Um, we'll send a, an email with like the recording of this lecture plus a couple of Hugo's links, um, some of the things he talked about. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Justin. Every now and then we'll do this, uh, you know, we'll do a free workshop with, you know, cool artists. Shout out Nikki Nair. He did one a couple months ago. It was awesome. And um, dude, just such a, Hugo, just such an honor to have you in the mix, man. And uh, it's been a pleasure to get to meet you and get to <laughs> get to get to know you, man. So yeah yeah you, you too justin um you too and yeah i just want to say good luck to everyone it's good to uh yeah speak to people who are um yeah getting started into production and, and other people who are just looking for for some tips i hope it's been helpful and uh yeah good luck with with the journey dude all righty guys i hope everyone has a lovely afternoon if you're in california or evening if you're in the uk or europe um and hopefully uh, we'll catch y'all soon. Hugo, thank you again, dude. Really, really appreciate it. <laughs> Much love, guys. Thanks, Thanks. everyone.